Hey there, I'm Mark. I'm one of the pastors at the downtown campus. Just want to welcome you today, and I hope you'll enjoy this teaching from God's Word. morning. My name is Chelsea and I'll be sharing our scripture for the morning. Philippians 4, 10 through 13. I rejoiced greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do this all through him who gives me strength. Thanks, Chelsea. So you're probably familiar with our title today, a song by the Rolling Stones. Don't worry, I'm not going to sing it. You would get no satisfaction in that. Yeah, one of the most popular songs of all time. I mean, if you're human, you can relate, right? It just seems that satisfaction is always kind of fleeting. And the harder we go after it, the more elusive uh, that it is. As the song goes, and I tried, and I tried, and I tried, and I tried. Now, this is proven historically. Empires are never big enough. Wealthy tycoons are never rich enough. uh, Powerful politicians are never quite powerful enough. Vacations are never long enough. Relationships are never quite loving enough. This is also proven statistically. A recent study at the University of Chicago found that only 14, 14% of Americans say they're very happy. Author and journalist Ruth Whitman wrote a book called America the Anxious, How Our Pursuit of Happiness is Creating a Nation of Nervous Wrecks. How's that for a title? Dang. She says this, as a Brit living in the United States, the sheer backbreaking intensity of the American approach to finding happiness can sometimes feel alien. People in America spend more time, emotional energy, and money in the quest for contentment than any nation on earth. In a culture that loves consumerism, happiness has become the ultimate consumer product. Despite all the effort and money they're pumping into the endeavor, Americans consistently rank as some of the least happy people in the developed world. One recent survey even placed the day-to-day happiness of the American people two places behind the citizens of Rwanda. What's more, Americans are far and away the most anxious people on the planet with nearly a third of people in this country likely to suffer from an anxiety disorder in their lifetime. So what is going wrong? Why isn't all this effort paying off? And she continues, A series of studies carried out by psychologists at UC Berkeley showed that paradoxically, the more intensely people value and pursue happiness as a distinct goal, the more likely they are to display symptoms of unhappiness, anxiety, loneliness, and even depression. Well, the Stones could have told you that, right? And I tried and I tried and I tried and I tried. Now, this is also proven personally. It just seems that that you and I are hard to please. Life would be so much better if, you know, fill in the blank. Uh, I'll finally be happy when. Get out of school, get that better job, when my spouse starts changing, uh, when I get married, uh, when we have kids, when we uh, get the kids out of the house, uh, when we get a better car, when we get the remodel, when we get the favorable doctor report, make more money, accomplish this goal, you know, our kids' success, always something more. In fact, that's what a lot of our prayers are about. God, change my circumstances, please, and then I'll be happy. Now, we all know this is true, but why is it true? And we might say, well, that's easy. I need certain things to get better, and when that happens, I'll be a lot happier. 
But is that even possible? Because when does that happen? Like when do all the stars align and life goes exactly the way that we want? I mean, if that's our expectation, we're going to be waiting a long time. Even more troubling is how many times we have finally got something or accomplished something we were really hoping for, praying for, waited a long time uh, to happen in our lives, and it finally happened, and we're like, is this all there is? <laughs> like, I thought it was going to change everything, but it didn't seem to do for me what I thought it would. You know, got the car, the raise, the win, got it done, but it seems to be short-lived. Like, have you ever been on that vacation? You're like, oh, I was planning for it and researched it, and here it is, you know, and you're there, and it's like, man, it could be better than this. I remember a romantic vacation with my wife. That's always, like, awesome to be away with my wife, and we were in a nice place, and I remember just enjoying all that until she said something to the effect of, you know, I'm not all that happy in our marriage right now. Right? Yeah, Ouch. It's, it's always something like that, right? Or buying the next thing, right? Well, I'm going to get that next purchase, and oh, wow, that's, that's really going to really do it. And then after a while, it's like, well, what's, what's the thing after that? Because what I just bought, now I'm insuring it, and I'm washing it, and it takes up more room, you know, and all this. You know, there's all these things. It's just, man, one thing after the next. Or how many times, this happens to me all the time, I can't even enjoy the situation I'm in because my mind is out there somewhere ahead. Tomorrow, next week, the next thing. Man, I hate that. That's so true about me. Or how about this? Has it ever happened to you where you're doing good, you're feeling content, life is like in one of those good seasons, until you go on social media and you see how someone else is doing? Right? You see how they're looking. You see where they're vacationing. Right? You see how their kids are doing. And you're like... Oh, I was doing good. Obviously, if we could be satisfied by the things our culture says, a lot of us would be by now, but we're not. And you know what? All the celebrities and the rich and the famous and the beautiful people, whoever they may be, those who have it all, we're finding they're not satisfied either. Tragically, a trail of brokenness, addiction, uh, suicide, I mean, just, just Google unhappy celebrities. There's like 29 million hits. Maybe another explanation for discontent is like the environment around us, like, like all the disappointing people around us. Like, you know what I'm talking about? Like, like the, the poor leaders that we see or the... the the, the foolishness, the, the ungodly ideologies. We're just like, if we could just fix that stuff or take them out, <laughs> then I'll be content. Then I'll finally, you know, be satisfied. That reminds me of another song, not nearly as popular, early 90s by a group called Meatloaf. The title is Life's a Lemon, I Want My Money Back. And they go through this song and they talk about all the things that are most important in our lives, generally speaking, love, sex, family, friends, hope, faith, religion, your town, your school, your work, your childhood, your future. And they say, all these things are broken and defective. They don't deliver. Life's a lemon. I want my money back. Thank you, Meatloaf, for that uplifting song. But you know, it's true. I, I look around, I see, I see a lot of that. I just see people so spun out and, and, and depressed and dissatisfied because of what they're experiencing in the environment around them. But again, I asked, if the only way to be satisfied in life is just to get rid of all those people or to somehow fix them, how do you expect that to happen? Like, when is that actually going to happen? Going to be waiting a long time for that. Now, the fact is, even when there's good leadership, the best leadership, we're going to find something to be grumpy about, right? Case in point, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. How's it get any better than that? And they weren't fully happy. 
How do you get a better leader than Jesus? And the disciples were always finding something to complain about. So maybe the problem's closer to home. Like I, I'll just talk about myself here, talk personally for a minute. I don't have to look anywhere else to be dissatisfied than just me. I mean, the, the, the times that I fall short, let myself down, let others down. Like, like if I can just get a better version of me, that would be awesome. Then I would be okay. But I ask the question one more time, when's that gonna happen? Like when do you finally get to the place where you're like, oh yeah, man, I, I'm happy with me now. You know, like I got no, you know, there's always going to be like somebody, something you let, you know, you let down. People, people go, Mark, I'm disappointed in you and you're this and you're not doing that. And sometimes people will tell me that. And, and, and that's never fun. But, but, as, but as I'm listening to them sometimes, I'm like, I can give you a couple more reasons. Like you need, like I, I'll give you better reasons than the ones you just gave to leave our church or whatever it might be. So like, when are we all, you know, when are we going to get it right in, our, in, our, in ourselves? I mean, it's not like we wake up in the morning like, oh, I, I want to let people down. That, that's not what we're, I'm not, to, we, want, we want to like love people and, and all that. But again, if that's what we're waiting for to be content, well, that's, you know, when's that going to happen? So as we process all these reasons why we're not happy in all these scenarios, we realize life is never going to be okay. Not the way that we want it to. And if it does happen, wait 10 minutes, right? So how can I be okay? How can you be okay when life is not okay? Our culture is lying to us through its teeth, and they double down every day. And they say, you got to get this. You got to look like her, look like him. Then your ship will come in. Then, you know, it'll make your day. Finally, the good life. And one of the saddest things is we just kind of fall right in line to the fool's parade. And we think this is what it's gonna, this is what it's gonna do in, in our lives. We just, and we buy that lie, that's so sad. I mean, it's one thing to buy a lemon, you don't know it. It's another thing to buy a lemon and we were warned. And that's what's going on here in our human lives and our, our, our life here on this earth. All the stuff in the world will never ultimately satisfy all the accomplishments that we desire will never make us more uh, joyful and content. And so there has to be a deeper reason for all this discontent. We're obviously missing something. We need to get to, I'm trying to drill down so we can get to the core issue. And, and this is what I think it is. This is, I think, the, the bedrock of why we are sort of discontented people. And it looks like this. If we need outside things to happen to make us satisfied and happy, then what that means is we are basing and building our identity on those things, not who we are. We need those things, possessions, accomplishments, comfort, success, you name it, to define us, to satisfy us, to prop us up because who we really are is built on that. Who we are is built on the scaffolding, not on who we really are. That's called the false self. It's the false self. Not okay with who we are, so make a false identity so that people will love us more. We can accept ourselves more. We can look more like the successful people or, 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 or you know, whatever, whatever you want to call it. Um, false self. There's a guy, Thomas Merton, a Catholic monk. I don't agree with everything he writes, but check this out. This is good. I use, well, it's not good, but I mean, it's, it's convicting, and I think it's true. I use up my life in the desire for pleasures and the thirst for experiences for power, honor, knowledge, and love to clothe this false self and construct its nothingness into something objectively real, and I wind experiences around myself and cover myself with pleasures and glory like bandages in order to make myself perceptible or acceptable to myself and to the world. As if I were an invisible body that could only become visible when something visible covered its surface. 
But there is no substance under the things with which I'm clothed. I'm hollow, and my structure of pleasure and ambitions has no foundation. And when they are gone, there'll be nothing left of me but my own nakedness and emptiness and hollowness. It's the false self. It's an identity crisis. That's what fuels our discontent more than anything else at the deepest level. I need approval so that I will be more accepted in people's eyes and in my own. I need these possessions in order to validate my worth. I need to be comfortable. I need to have it all together and to kind of look it with others because that's just what causes me to feel like I'm an important person. I mean, I can go on and on. And so what can be done about this? Are we just sort of doomed to sit in our misery for the rest of our lives? Like, is there an answer for this? I'm glad you asked. Because right here in our text, Philippians 4, as we get to the very end, one more week in our Joyride series in Philippians, but here, as Chelsea read, just to, let me re read it again, huge, huge an answer for us. Paul says, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Let's unpack this a little bit. Verse 10, Paul's saying, Thank you for your financial gift. The Philippian church sent him a gift. People in prison in that day really needed outside support. Brian talked about that last week. And Paul's like, thank you so much for your gift. It, it, it blessed me here in prison. But I want you to know, I have learned to be content. Whether I have little or plenty, I have what I need. I've experienced both extremes. I've been in the poorhouse and the penthouse. You know, I, I've experienced ramen and, and ribeye. And, and I, I'm good. He says, I'm good either way. And he says in verse 12, it's a secret that he's learned. In other words, this is not common knowledge. Most people, not even many people, know this. It's, it's, it's learned. And, and that means it's learnable. That means it's available for all of us. In any, check that out. Any and every situation pretty much sums it up right there. He says, secret. So he's been initiated. He's been, he says, I'm part of a group. It's a very small group, but you can join too, and I can help you. We've learned the secret. And the big idea today is true contentment and how to get it. True contentment and how to get it. One Bible dictionary defines contentment this way. An internal satisfaction which does not demand changes in external circumstances. That's good. Jeremiah Burroughs was a pastor in the 1600s, and he wrote a little book called The Rare Jewel of Christian Contentment. Actually, his definition from this text here in Philippians is this. I love this. Contentment's an inward, peaceful disposition. That's what we're looking for right there. Right, I mean, an inward, peaceful disposition. And it's so interesting that this word contentment actually means self-sufficient. At first when I read that, I'm like, that's strange. Self-sufficient. So that doesn't mean I don't need anybody's help. That doesn't mean I'm some independent, I can do this on my own. What this means, it can't mean that. There's too much scripture that teaches against that. What this means is we take personal responsibility for it. I don't have to depend on anybody or any circumstance for this inner condition that I have. I'm taking personal responsibility. So true contentment on how to get it, three things. First is we gotta realize what it's not because there's a lot of confusion about content, a lot of bad definitions of confusion. One is pretending our problems aren't problems. Oh, I'm okay, I'm content. You know, no, I mean, when it hurts, own it, admit it. Like, oh, this hurts. This, this is a problem. Uh, cry out to God. Acknowledge the heartache. 
Share appropriately with some others in your life. Yes to all those things, but still be content. Contentment is not complacency with yourself. I hear that a lot. Well, I'm content. I don't really have to grow. I'm going to heaven anyway. No, that's complacency. That's not content. That's laziness. We, because we are saved people, and I hope you are, I hope your sins are forgiven and you've come to Christ in faith and he's come into your life, because of that, we are now motivated to love people to be the best version of you that you can be. Not for an identity formation, but because of the identity you already have. So we're going to be a worshiper of Jesus and a lover of people to the best of our ability because of Christ. So it's not complacency. And it's not complacency with the world. Uh, it's all going to hell in a handbasket. Who cares? I'm supposed to be content. No. We should be Jesus people in our community, in our world, and to try to meet the needs as much as we can around us. It's not, it's not hopeless resignation. It's hopeful dependence. And it's not related to people or circumstances. You would think it's related to money and comfort and success and all that kind of stuff. But Paul, exhibit A, he's like, got nothing. He's got none of that stuff. He's no money, no family. He's been beaten up. He's in prison because he's a Christian. He's facing execution. He's criticized by pastors on the outside, taking shots at him. He's been forgotten by many people, yet he's upbeat, upbeat joyful. He says, man, I'm good. I'm, I'm good. It's like he's saying to us, listen carefully. Let me save you a lot of pain and problems. The wealthy person is not the person who gets what they want. The wealthy person is the person who wants what they get. God, whatever you've given to me, I'm good with that, especially you in my life. So that's what contentment's not. Number two, realize contentment is learned. Two times in this very short passage, the word learned. So this doesn't come naturally. It's, it's something we have to discover over time. So it means it's, it's something that, that we're going we're gonna to grow in. Because I've, I've, learned to, I've learned about the character of God. I've learned that I can count on God. When everything is crushing me, I know who's holding me. That's the idea. And and this idea of, of learning, like what do we learn? Well, we learn that God's good. We learn that he's loving. We learn that he's sovereign. We learn that, that he is better. And we also have learned that our world is a lemon, right? That it's a loser, that there's a lot of dead ends that we go down. That's the false self that we think will make and break our lives. These are things that we can learn. This, Paul's like, this is where I'm at. And this is where you can be as well. And we, we're going to grow over time in learning. So over five years, ten years, even over this time last year, that we're further along in learning contentment because we're not duped. We don't buy the lies. Okay, so, so this now all points to the main secret. Right here, verse 13. We've drilled down. We've exposed the biggest, we've peeled it away, and we've exposed the main reason for our discontent, which is a false identity. And we've put, we're going to put this answer. We love Jesus so much, and he gives us this answer for this deep human condition. He says, I can do all of this through Christ who strengthens me. So what we're looking at here, number three, is to realize Jesus is enough. So I'm going to contradict myself here. I've been saying the whole message that as long as we're depending on outside things, it's never going to work. But there's one outside thing. And it's the strong one that we bring into our lives by faith who then is strong in us. The only truly contented person, truly is the Jesus person who's allowing Jesus to, to, to live that and be that in their life. Now, I have to say this. You guys all know this verse is taken out of context big time. I can do all things, right? It's on the back of the marathoner shirt. 
You know, it's the, it's the athlete interviewed after the game. I did all this because Christ strengthened me. Look, that's not really what this is talking about. In fact, the context here, you take the word do, I, I can do, it really means more endure. I can endure. Whatever life throws at me, I can endure that because of Christ who gives me. The strong one has made me strong because he's in me. I have a father in heaven. He loves me. He's holding me because of Christ. He doesn't, you know, he doesn't drop me. And because of Jesus and the gospel, when we put our faith in Christ as our Savior, we're no longer defined. We don't have to be defined by accomplishments and possessions and the opinions of people. It's like Jesus opens the prison door out of our false self, and we can step into our true identity, accepted, loved unconditionally, part of God's family. And this lack of contentment in our lives, if we're courageous enough, will point us to things that we need to see and deal with, like the false self. Why am I so needing this? Why did I get so spun out when this didn't happen or whatever it might be? It'll tell us things. But not only that, not just tell us about our false self, it'll tell us about false gods. What are idols? Idols are things in our lives that we make ultimate. Idols can be good things God has given to us that we make ultimate things, and that's a bad thing. And so when things don't go the way we're so invested, our joy, and it's all kind of built on this happening or that not happening, and then when we get let down and we fall apart, or whether it's emotionally or anger, or whatever it might be, it's like, well, what God or false God in our life was threatened or pulled, uh, pulled out uh, from under us? It's been said that one of the ways for us to identify potential idols in our life. There's three ways, three, if you, you want to jot this down, it's not in your notes, but uh, one, Tim Keller mentions this, I think he's right on. He says one way is what do we think about easily? It's called the imagination, like where does your mind go easily? That'll often point to what's ultimate in our lives. Or what do we spend money on easily? Will often point to what's ultimate in our lives. Or what triggers our emotions easily? Because we can say, you know, we talk about this a lot around here. You made me angry. Uh, you make me depressed. They're like, so they're like, no, no, what, what's deep, where is that coming from? Often it's follow the smoke to the altar that the fire where a false god is being worshipped. So if we follow those things, we have the courage to follow, and we should because we're under grace. We, we're going to want to know, like, where is this coming from? False self, false gods. It's like, here's an example of this, Hebrews 13, 5. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what, with what you have. Why? Because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. God's like, I'm holding you. I love Frank with the baby. Right? I, I like to say we planned it that way. I wanted to give you a visual. And that contentedness, like Psalm 131 says, like a weaned baby in his mother's arms, and in this case, father's arms, and, and that, oh, I'm good. Life, is, life, life could be like unraveling all around, but I'm good. I'm in my parents' arms. I mean, that's, that's the idea. We're God's kids. He'll never leave us or forsake us. And if God's my dad... You could take the house, take the car, take my health. I still have God, right? Now, I don't want to lose my house. I don't want to lose my health. But if that happens, I still have all that I need. But if I have all of that stuff and no God, then we'll never be happy and satisfied. That's the secret here. You give me the world, and it's never enough. But you give me Jesus and I have it all. As one of our favorite psalms says in verse 1 of 23, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. I'm content. And it kind of looks like this. Christ plus nothing equals everything. 
It's not that nothing category is not important, but we so embrace and sort of exalt that whatever, whatever the blank is there to think, oh yeah, I got Jesus, but I got to have all these other things too. No, Christ plus nothing equals everything. Or another way of putting that is everything minus Jesus equals nothing. You can have it all without Jesus. It's a big zero. So what a wonderful place to be that we can be okay when life is not okay. And it's all about how true of a statement is this in our lives, right here, that Christ is enough. Thankful for whatever else he gives, and he gives us a lot, but that Christ is enough. And I want to leave you with just kind of one sort of takeaway, um, like a workshop kind of a deal. You know, you got the lecture and then you got the lab. So here's kind of a workshop thing for you. Um, the psalmist in 42, he, he says, why are you downcast, oh my, oh my. So I'm sharing this with you because cause it's going gonna, it's gonna to hit us like in an hour. It's gonna, it's gonna, we're going to be struggling with this all week. It's contentment. So he says, why are you downcast, oh my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I'll yet praise him, my Savior and my God. My soul's downcast within me, therefore... I will remember you. Now, it's just an illustration here. What the psalmist does is, first, honest about feelings, honest about emotions. Pouring heart out to God. And if you read the rest of this psalm, and then 43, he talks about, he he talks to God. He's basically talking to God about his problems. And it's as simple as that. Sometimes that right there changes us. Don't worry. Instead, Pray, right? Saw that last week. Four, four, six, right? Talks to God about his problems. But, but don't miss this. He also talks to his problems about God. You ever thought of it that way? It might look kind of weird talking to your problems. Like, tell him about God. Remind yourself about how loving, how good, how much he's in control. There is such powerful victory there when we just talk to our problems about God and we're reminded. So here's the challenge for this week. It's just real simple. That as you're laying in bed before you go to sleep, that you'll just think about praise, thanks, and and be as positive as you can. It's essentially the verses right before this, this text. We're going to replace discontent. We're going to kick it out by praise and joy, by thanksgiving. Go to sleep rattling off everything that you have to be thankful for. Amen? That's the idea. And we're going to see some contentedness happen in our lives because of the strong one who comes in to make us strong. Let's pray together. And if you're here and you've never started as a Christian, you've never realized that the starting point for all of this is inviting the strong one to come live inside of you. The Bible says we do that by faith, not by works. And that Jesus wants to forgive us and come and live inside of us, make us a Christian. And then change our lives as, as we let him do that and grow. If you've never done that, just it's not complicated. You say, Jesus, forgive me. Take my sin away. I need you. I've gone down so many dead end roads. Take my sin. Please forgive me. Wash it away. Make me a Christian today. And if you just prayed that prayer, man, praise God. Let somebody know today or on the connect card, check the Jesus box so we can send you some information. And Lord, for all of us, we thank you for your word and we now depend on you to to take it deep into our hearts. I pray that we would have minds that are on you and deeper in love with you and talking to you all the time and being people that are positive and, and thankful and filled with praise, ultimately realizing that with you we have enough, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.